Buddhism began in northeast India 2,500 years ago. It is now one of the fastest growing religions in the West. There are many different schools and traditions of Buddhism, all of which originate in India. But this chanting isn't from India, it's in Croydon Buddhist Centre in southeast London. This is Buddhism in the West. On its great journey from India, Buddhism has adapted to many different cultures. The West is no exception, with its own style of Buddhism called the Friends of the Western Buddhist Order, or the FWBO. As Dharma Vijaya from Croydon Buddhist Center explains, the FWBO has been in the Croydon area for some time. There was a Buddhist community in Purley over 30 years ago. And in fact, when the Friends of the Western Buddhist Order was founded, some of its members started to practice within that community. And eventually, it became a community operating purely under the auspices of the Friends of the Western Buddhist Order. In order to financially support themselves, Western Buddhists often create their own businesses, which are then run according to Buddhist principles. This is unique to the FWBO. Vishvapani, the editor of Dharma Life, a popular Buddhist magazine, explains how this works. One of the things that we've uh, put a lot of effort into is what we call right livelihood. And what that means in practice is Buddhists choosing to work together. And actually, some of them have been very successful and run very successful kind of businesses which are based on ethical uh, principles. In running their own businesses, the FWBO ensures that whilst earning a living, they do not accidentally infringe any of their own beliefs. Dharma Vijaya describes the Croydon Buddhist Centre's own experiences with right livelihood. We've developed various businesses, initially a vegetarian restaurant in West Croydon, which after leasing it uh, was, I think, reclaimed by the council to make way for the new West Croydon bus station. And they rehoused us in our present premises on the high street, so in some ways that was a very you know, uh, good stroke of luck because well, we're in some ways ideally situated in terms of accessibility. Functioning as a Buddhist centre within a high street can have its drawbacks. The noisy city environment can often disrupt the peace of mind, which is so important to Buddhist practice. Vijaya Shri, the chairwoman of the Croydon Buddhist Centre, explains. What we're aiming to do is, is become more and more mindful and there is so much that distracts. So what we try to do is go on retreat on a regular basis. We'll go away for a week or two, somewhere that's quiet in the country, that's beautiful, you know, either alone or with other people, and, uh, and give more time to practice. I think everybody needs that kind of refreshment to their practice. Buddhism has had a long journey to the West. Kalananda, the author of several books concerning Buddhism, describes the origins of Buddha. The Buddha was a man who lived two and a half thousand years ago. He was an Indian prince who became disillusioned with the household life, and disillusioned with the aristocratic life that he was living, left home and went forth to find out how things really were, what the nature of reality really was. Mythology has it that Buddha attempted to discover the truth about life in many different ways. He had experienced the life of luxury as a prince, so he tried a life of deprivation to find happiness. This, however, proved fruitless, and, as Vijaya Shri describes, he eventually reached his goal after years of meditation. He wandered from place to place in India, and eventually, after quite a period of time, probably about six years, he uh, gained a state which Buddhists call enlightenment, a state of wisdom and compassion. and. The, the word Buddha, actually, it's not a name, it's a title. It means uh, the awakened one, he who is awake. It is believed that on reaching enlightenment, the Buddha was given insight into the nature of reality. He then wanted to share what he had learned with other people. Vishvapani explains how Buddha's teachings began spreading through India. The Buddha just taught. He didn't write anything. And people memorized what he taught. And then different traditions grew up. So by 500 years after the Buddha's death, so you're talking about the time of Christ, uh, there were already starting to be very different schools of Buddhism in India itself. Buddhism became extremely popular and spread throughout many eastern countries. Kalananda describes its journey from India. Buddhism originated in northeastern India, and from there it spread south to what is now Sri Lanka, 
It spread up towards what is now Afghanistan and through what is now Pakistan. It spread up into Tibet and into China, uh, Southeast Asia and Japan. Although no war has ever been waged in the name of Buddhism and its teaching emphasizes a passive nature, its past has not been without tragedy. Alison Murdoch, the manager of the Jamyang Buddhist Center, explains. The Chinese started moving into Tibet uninvited between about 1950 and particularly 1959, which is when um, His Holiness the Dalai Lama left Tibet. Um, and many of the senior monks left with him because they were concerned about the survival of the religion under the Chinese. The senior monks in Tibet appear to have been right to be worried because the Buddhism, flourishing at this time, was destroyed. In the 1960s, with the Cultural Revolution, incredible damage was wreaked on Tibetan monasteries and the architecture, books, culture was systematically um, destroyed. Despite this devastation, Alison Murdoch believes the situation may be improving. I've been to Tibet twice. I was there in 1988 and then I was there again last year. And I did see improvements, that there's a tremendous amount of rebuilding is going on. And I did see evidence of people being able to study quite seriously, people printing books again. But it's very, very small compared to the amount of practice that was going on before. The Dalai Lama is always a significant figure within Tibetan Buddhism. He is often seen as an ambassador for Buddhism in general. Vishvapani, the editor of Dharma Life, explains how Tibetan Buddhists view him. Before Tibet was occupied by the Chinese, the Dalai Lama was the head of state. and He's believed to be the reincarnation of a previous enlightened teacher who chose to be reborn for the sake of uh, carrying on teaching in, in his next life. The Dalai Lama is often seen as a Buddhist pope, but is he as significant outside Tibet as he is inside? Buddhist author Kalananda explains. He's a head of the Tibetan government, he's as it were a king, and he's very much looked up to by all the figures within Tibetan Buddhism. He has a very central place in Tibet itself and in the Tibetan exile community, but he's not a pope. And not all Buddhists um, regard him as authoritative, although many people respect him very highly. On its great journey, Buddhism adapted and evolved, creating new styles, traditions and ceremonies. But how did this wide variety of new schools come about? Vijaya Sri, the head of Croydon Buddhist Centre, explains. You tend to find that whatever is the indigenous culture or, or religion of a country, it will adapt or there'll be a, a sort of a, a fusion of the, the indigenous culture and the, the Buddhist ideals and so each of the Eastern countries which uh, is Buddhist there's quite a different character to the Buddhism. The central teachings of Buddhism emphasize that Buddha was awake to reality. His teachings therefore are seen by Buddhists to be based on truth. If Buddhism is based on universal truths why then must it adapt to different cultures? It's a question of what does adapt. So the central truths of Buddhism don't adapt because they, they're there to be realized, but the path by which we um, move towards them does. Moving from India and adapting to other Eastern cultures is one task for Buddhism. However, adapting to the West is a radical departure. Why are Westerners interested in a religion based on an Indian culture that is 2,500 years old? Dharma Life editor Vishvapani explains the origins of Western interest. Westerners, first of all, encountered Buddhism through the empire you know, the different empires, um, and then they need to understand what it was, who it was they conquered exactly, uh, mainly in order to know how to exploit them and that sort of thing. But then some people start to get very interested in the Buddhist scriptures that they were discovering. The interest in Buddhism in the West grew, but this interest was mainly scholarly. This initial encounter, however, led to a greater and more significant interest many years later. Initially in the 60s, obviously there was like, a whole kind of hippie thing of going east and discovering these eastern teachers. And then that kind of went out of the headlines, but a lot of people actually became Buddhists at the time. So once they sort of really learned what that was and become mature in their practice, they started to found Buddhist movements. So there are Buddhist movements all over the West now, hundreds of centres just in Britain. 
The flexibility that characterizes Buddhism's journey has been no less dramatic in the West. The West has quite a different culture to the region where Buddhism originated. Vishvapani suggests that this means existing traditions need to adapt once again. What we need in the West is a form of Buddhism that's appropriate to the West. So we need to keep to the, the central teachings that are common to all traditions. The necessity of a Buddhism that complements a Western lifestyle led to a fusion of different beliefs and ultimately the formation of the FWBO. As a Buddhist author, Kalananda is well acquainted with its origins. The FWBO was founded by a man called Sangha Akshita, an Englishman who'd lived in India for 20 years, lived there as a Buddhist monk. He returned to in England in 1964, and in 1967 he founded the FWBO, the Friends of the Western Buddhist Order. Buddhism has adapted to the West, but this does not mean a Western Buddhist leads a completely Western lifestyle. On the contrary, according to Vijaya Sri, the first ever chairwoman of the Croydon Buddhist Centre, Westerners make a dramatic life change. One of the major changes in orientation is, is towards leading a more and more simple life rather than a more and more materially acquisitive life. And um, I think one thing that happens in, in the practicing of meditation and developing of self-awareness is that uh, through that you, you do become content with less. Om Muni Muni Maha Muni Shakya Muni Swaha Not only are the major changes in lifestyle addressed in Buddhism, but the seemingly small areas, such as eating habits, also constitute a radical life change. For example, Buddhists believe in vegetarianism, because all life is considered sacred. Dharma Vijaya, from Croydon Buddhist Centre, explains. But even being a vegetarian does, of course, require a change of your life, I mean, if you weren't already a vegetarian. And there may be other sort of ethical issues that you become conscious of through your meditation practice, which uh, lead you to realise you have to make definite changes in your life, leave things behind that you're rather attracted to, and take up things that uh, may seem very challenging and demanding. Within Buddhism, leaving behind things that you desire applies not only to food, but life in general. Susie Slack from the Friends of the Western Buddhist Order suggests that even celibacy is often considered a desirable state. You can choose to become celibate. Um, like when you're ordained, you can choose to take what's called brahmacharya, which means you take a vow of celibacy. Um, and, and also, you can choose at any time. You can choose to take a brahmacharya vow for a certain amount of time. And uh, people do that quite often, actually, just for three months or six months or whatever, just to try it. For a Westerner who is not involved in Buddhism, it may be difficult to see what can be gained from depriving yourself. It may appear strange to avoid aspects of life which are pleasurable and often considered desirable. If what one's attracted to and enjoys is of a limiting nature, you know, if, we, if we feel that it uh, confines our horizons, leads, leads us to feel as it were, straight-jacketed, uh, then to leave behind the enjoyments that, uh, that limit us can pave way for taking up uh, practices which liberate us. From the outside, being celibate may be regarded as a suppression of sexuality. However, within Buddhism, it is seen to be working towards controlling emotion rather than have it control you. Most people start thinking about someone they fancy and they might go off into some scenario of them meeting up and then getting together and having sex right well um, so if you're if you're trying to look out for these things you would you would notice the thought and you would you would try and notice the, the sort of emotional flavor of it of that thought and hopefully you'd realize that you were getting into a craving quite early on so then you would say oh I know what this is this is just actually sexual craving and I and I'm just going to let go of it try and let go of it. Um, so you wouldn't go off on one, you know, into a story. Buddhism is a very difficult life change for Westerners. It is based on principles formed within a completely different culture. Why then do they turn to this religion? The author, Kalananda, himself a Westerner, explains why he thinks they are drawn to Buddhism. I think people turn to Buddhism because it's reasonable, it's founded in reason, uh, although it does go beyond reason. It does have within it um, a mythical element and emotional elements uh, which appeal to the heart as well as the head. 
but it nowhere requires that we sort of suspend our, our, our rational faculties and just make a leap of faith into something which we can't otherwise explain. Speaking from the grounds of St John the Baptist Church in Kingston, Reverend Peter Horton suggests why he thinks Westerners turn to Buddhism. I think one of the reasons is a disillusionment in the answers that possibly the traditional monotheistic faiths of the West give. They don't give the answers that, um, that those people are, are looking for. They're not satisfied with the answers. He also believes that interest is based on the West's perception of the East. And there's a sort of perceived greater spirituality about the, about the East. Whereas in our own Western society, we're highly rationalistic, we, um, we're very much more cerebral and we've actually lost something about the, of the senses, other senses. Um, and that, that appears to be available in the more Eastern forms of religion. As Susie Slack from the Friends of the Western Buddhist Order has experienced, Buddhism can often provide an alternative to the hedonism and excesses that a successful Western lifestyle can sometimes bring. I'd had um, a very unhappy few years. Um, I used to be a fairly successful fashion stylist, um, and things, life in general, got to me. Um, I mean, and I was doing drugs and all sorts of stuff, and becoming uh, over the years more and more um, unhappy, really, and well, falling apart. Um, and then I fell apart, and uh, and then I wanted to try and start a new life, really. A religion that contains such a wide variety of influences inevitably has something for everybody. This is why Vishvapani, editor of Dharma Life Buddhist magazine, believes that there is such a mixed range of Westerners who are interested in Buddhism. Westerners who practice Buddhism have got a whole range of different lifestyles. Some of them become monks. Other people um, just carry on their life, more or less, in the same way. But meditate every morning. I think that's the most important thing that Westerners who practice Buddhism do. They meditate. Meditation is a central aspect of life for Western Buddhists, but it is often unclear exactly what it is. Here, describing meditation, is Paul Beck, a Buddhist meditation teacher for the Samatha Trust. There are different types and traditions of meditation, but essentially a meditation practice as taught often in the West is a way of stilling the mind in order to uh, basically practice states of calm and concentration. Meditation, however, takes great effort and perseverance to perfect. So what can be gained from this? When one has calmed the mind, then the mind that's actually quite still is able, is in a sense freer and therefore that leads on quite naturally with a, a mind that's actually free from what's normally happening in it from moment to moment. According to Alison Murdoch, head of Jamyang Buddhist Centre, the practice of meditation leads to a state where not only the mind becomes more focused, but this change itself brings about a new view of the world in often unexpected ways. If I was eating a plate of something delicious, I would taste the first mouthful, maybe the second mouthful, maybe possibly the third mouthful, and after that, totally unaware, my mind's gone on to something else and I'm having a conversation or having a drink or doing something else. I never realised before just how totally erratic the mind is. So one aspect of meditation is being able to calm the mind and really being able to control it and focus it on the object of your choice. Before a group meditates together, incense is sometimes burned. This can provide the mind with something to focus and concentrate on. Paul Beck suggests it also has a more traditional role. If one wants to develop the ritual side of meditation, um, which is a degree of ceremony, then one could use one could use candles, make candles, one can use incense. In a pure meditation sense, it's just all part of the same thing. It's part of allowing the mind to settle in a particular way. Buddhist meditation is often linked with the practice of chanting. There are many different types of chanting for different occasions. Here, Buddhist magazine editor Vishvapani explains the most common chant within Buddhism which is considered a homage to what is known as the Three Jewels. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa The central act of being a Buddhist, the, the central thing that you do is what's talked about in all different Buddhist traditions, is going for refuge to the Three Jewels. That's the Buddha, the ideal of enlightenment, 
the Dharma, the teachings of Buddhism and the Buddhist path, and the Sangha, which is a spiritual community. So all over the world, what Buddhists do is they chant uh, what are called the refuges, which is committing yourself or going for refuge to the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha. Dutyampi Buddhang Saranang Chami Dutyampi Dhamma Buddhist author Kalananda explains that there is a central belief and core to Buddhist practice. I think you could say the fundamental teachings of Buddhism are that life as we know it is unsatisfactory. We're not able to get ultimate satisfaction, not full lasting, as it were, eternal satisfaction within the life that most of us lead. The sense of dissatisfaction is based on the understanding that life is unpredictable and uncontrollable. The chairwoman of Croydon Buddhist Centre, Vijaya Sri, explains the Buddhist view of this. All Buddhists would accept the same basic truth, um, the truth of change and impermanence, and the truth that it's possible for human beings to grow and develop beyond our present state, you know, moving towards the state of enlightenment. Um, we'd also see the truth of conditionality, that all things arise in dependence on certain conditions and fade away when those conditions are no longer present. That's, you know, in a way one of the basic teachings of the Buddha. That's universally relevant. Buddhism has developed beliefs known as the Four Noble Truths. Dharma Vijaya from Croydon Buddhist Centre describes how these provide Buddhists with an understanding of the dissatisfaction life can sometimes bring. Now what the teaching of the Four Noble Truths suggests is that that craving to take away the unsatisfactory element from our life is actually fruitless. We'd be far better to face up to and fully experience that sense of emptiness within us and through becoming fully aware of that grow bigger than it and find a deeper source of satisfaction than the distractions that we usually turn to offer. Buddhism has many other beliefs which span across the various traditions. Here, Buddhist writer Kalananda describes the law of karma. The idea of karma is that actions have consequences. That's perhaps the easiest way of thinking about it. That are intentional, voluntary acts whether they be of body, of speech, of mind, have outcomes in the world for ourselves and for others. And therefore, we always reap the fruits of our actions. And if we act with a good intention, that will lead to positive consequences. And if we act with a bad intention, with a harmful intention, that will lead to negative consequences. The idea that actions have direct consequences is a powerful concept. As a member of the Friends of the Western Buddhist Order, Susie Slack explains, that this idea is already ingrained in Western culture. Unskillful actions from the past had, had very major consequences for me and for others. Um, and uh, yeah, actions definitely have consequences, not only for the actor, but uh, for other people and for the world in general. And that's how I think of karma. Um, you know, what goes around comes around, that phrase. Karma also states that actions may not have consequences within this lifetime, but may have consequences in future lifetimes. Here, Kalananda introduces the concept of reincarnation. Buddhists don't so much think of reincarnation as rebirth. There's an important difference between these two. With the idea of reincarnation, you've got the idea of a body being reborn, a fixed, unchanging personality being reborn, or an unchanging soul which migrates from body to body to body. With Buddhism, rather, you have the idea of rebirth. The concept of rebirth, however, is probably more difficult for Westerners to grasp. Susie Slack here uses a common metaphor to explain rebirth. It's as though you have a lit candle, a candle flame, and then you get another candle and you light it from the first flame. So the second flame that you've just lit isn't the same flame as the first one, but it's come from that flame. Buddhism is quite different to other religions in some very fundamental ways. Alison Murdoch from the Jamyang Buddhist Center finds it is often debated whether or not it is a religion or a philosophy. I think it's quite possible for people to get an enormous amount out of it on a philosophical level as a philosophy. And an awful lot of it is philosophy and the Dalai Lama has said that. But it also has a lot of practices um, and also commitments 
that um, would be very close to what's commonly seen as, as religion. Buddhism also conflicts with other religions on the area of God. It's non-theistic. I mean, there is no creator God in Buddhism. So it's, uh, it's very much down to you, you know. You're the person who is um, in control of your life and your mind, um, which a lot of people don't realise. I mean, you know, uh, it's very easy to think you're not in control of your mind, and actually, most of the time, we're not. But we can begin to be more in control of our mind and therefore our lives. Dharma Life editor Vishvapani here describes the basis for Buddhist belief. Buddhism doesn't start from God telling man what the truth is. Buddhism starts from a man discovering from his own experience what he thought the truth was. And then from other people who are trying to find out in their own experience what the truth is, but by following the teachings of the Buddha. Many people take a passing interest in Buddhism. Buddhist author Kalananda suggests it should be taken more seriously. Buddhism isn't something that you just add on to an existing life, a bit like uh, pottery or, or judo or something like that. It's not just a hobby or a pastime, but something which transforms the whole of your life. Many people who have turned to Buddhism have found it to be a great step. Western Buddhists like Dharma Vijaya from Croydon Buddhist Centre would like to see more people turn to Buddhism. Where I'd like to see Buddhism going would be for more and more people to feel attracted to that challenge of radically changing their lives, such as is demanded of a Buddhist practice. For the FWBO, they will continue to try and expand and encourage people to try their brand of Buddhism in an attempt at combining Buddhist philosophy with a Western lifestyle. One possible area of expansion of our activities is in the United States. We have a small foothold there, uh, but there is a good deal of interest in Buddhism and a growing interest in the Friends of the Western Buddhist Order. As chairwoman of Croydon Buddhist Centre, Vijaya Sri has noticed an increase in Buddhism in recent years. Having seen the last few years and seeing how many people are increasingly interested in the ideals of Buddhism and leading some kind of spiritual life, I do think that Buddhism has a tremendous amount to offer to the West. and. Uh, I think that it's established and I think it will continue to grow. Buddhism has been in the West in many forms for some time now. Its success around the world is undoubtedly due to its ability to adapt to new cultures and to fuse with existing societies. If it continues to be taken up by Westerners as a serious way of life, it will continue to be one of the fastest growing religions in the West.